Um, our next speaker, uh, Anna Kut, is head of social policy uh, at the New Economics Foundation, which is uh, perhaps um, UK's leading independent uh, think tank. Uh, she is the uh, leading analyst in the field of social policy, has written widely on issues such as um, sustainable development, uh, public health policy, uh, public involvement and democratic dialogue, gender and equality. Uh, she was responsible for influential work on health and sustainable development as Commissioner for Health with the uh, UK Susten Sustainable Development Commission. Uh, her latest publications at the New Economics Foundation uh, include the Prevention Papers, The Wisdom of Prevention, uh, The Big Society, and The New Austerity, and 21 Hours. So, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Anna Kut. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, actually, my latest publication is this one, which I'm going to be talking about. So this is called Time on Our Side, Why We All Need a Shorter Working Week. Um, the organization that I work for, uh, the New Economics Foundation, starts from the premise that uh, the society, environment, and economy are interdependent, inextricably linked, and mutually reinforcing. So you cannot do economic policy without doing environmental policy. You can't do social policy without doing economic and environmental policy and so on. You have to see the three together. And that's really where we began thinking about time and what it was all about and why we all feel we're so busy and what our time is, is, is uh, how we value and think and experience our time. So, no. The other way up, maybe. Got it. It's only really quite recently that we've started to think about time in discrete, uniform units. So we've got seconds, minutes, hours, etc. Uh, but this is really a, um, a, a recent invention. But the, the fact is that, which dates back to the um, Industrial Revolution, effectively. That, so we now have time that is the same whether we're in Finland or Beijing or New York or London. And of course, the fact that we have these uh, uniform, discrete uh, units of time that are the same anywhere in the world mean that they, can, they have become a tradable commodity. But um, in fact, all times are not equal. This is a picture of a lovely old sundial in the um, archaeological museum in Istanbul, as it happens. And it shows that we've always been interested in kind of being able to tell the time by the sun. But in fact, we haven't always thought of time the same way, experienced time the same way as we do today. Um, and we still do experience time in many different ways. So time can be a gift. If you're looking after a child, you give your time to that child. And it isn't something you sell. It means something different to you. You might be doing more than one thing at once. It might be something that time can sometimes stretch out uh, for what seems like an age, and sometimes it can rush by, and uh, time can be a tyranny. How many of you feel that you're too busy to do the things you really want to do in life? So, there, I think, perhaps a few of you anyway. I don't know, maybe it's different in Finland, and you all lead very relaxed lives, but I can tell you it's not like that in London. <laughs> um, so, time is, so, how we understand time is a social construction. That's the first point to bear in mind with what I'm going to say. And all times are not equal, and time is what we make of it. We've heard the expression, time is money. Actually, time is much more precious than that. So our proposition then, based on this book, um, or rather explored in this book, I think, not based on the book, explored in this book, is that we should make what we might now consider part-time the new full-time, that we move slowly but steadily to shorter and more flexible hours of paid work so that something equivalent to 30 hours becomes the new norm. Um, or perhaps it's equivalent stretched across a year. We're not saying everybody has to work exactly 30 hours, but we want to move in that direction. 
And we want to do this because we think it will help to achieve social justice and well-being for all, um, a sustainable environment, and a prosperous econo economy that is not dependent on infinite economic growth. So it'll be good for society, it's good for the environment, and it's good for the economy. There is no such thing as a new idea. Here's the great economist John Maynard Keynes, who predicted in 1930, shows how wrong economists' predictions can be, that by the 21st century, uh, productivity gains would be such that we would all have to work no more than 15 hours a week. And our main concern would be, as he puts it, how to use freedom from pressing economic cares. And he said that in 1930. He was right about a lot of things, but he was spectacularly wrong about that. Let's just look for a minute at some of the um, figures for Sweden here. You'll see that 72% uh, of the population work approximately between 35 and 40 hours a week, that 18% uh, work less than 30 hours. There's a, not nearly such a marked gender difference here as there is in the UK. And you've got about 9% of the population working more than 40 hours a week. In the UK, that's uh, 1 in 5, 20% working more than 45 hours a week. So we're nowhere near what Keynes predicted, whether you're in Finland or the UK or indeed anywhere else in, in, in Europe or, the, or practically any country we could think of. So why is it then that uh, people work such long hours? And I think, why was Keynes wrong, if you like? Firstly, Keynes was right to predict that productivity would grow, but what he hadn't anticipated for, for a start was that the share that workers received of productivity gains were, were dramatically curtailed in between the time that he made his prediction and now. So workers did not get the same uh, back from their uh, increased productivity as they did, as he, uh, as he had predicted that they would. And secondly, he didn't really predict this uh, expanding um, trend in consumerism and uh, the expanding preferences that we have, what we aspire to, what we want to buy, how much stuff we need to buy, and how this actually fuels uh, the way that the capitalist economy works and, and has worked ever since. So he didn't really predict that that, that would drive us and not only to work longer hours to get more money to buy more things, but also drive us into debt to buy more things which meant that we had to work longer hours in order to service our debt. So that's the sort of dynamic that hadn't really been predicted. So those are two reasons why Keynes was wrong, and other things have changed as well. Work for many people is more congenial now than it was um, in, in Keynes' days. So we enjoy our work. Well, our friends are there. We, we learn things at work, some of us anyway, more of us should apparently. Um, also, hard work is highly valued. Um, our government are always telling us how the only valuable people in the country are hard-working families, as they put it. Which means people who are working for money for a long time, the longer the better, the harder the better. And there the people are valued. If you're not doing paid work, you're a scrounger or a skiver. So we're culturally encouraged to think that hard work is very important. And um, long hours of work are linked to success. And uh, being busy is high status. Actually, a, a colleague of mine who wrote a chapter of this book said uh, he had recently had a conversation with an 11-year-old. I think it was his niece. And he said, how are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm very busy. He said, why are you busy? Oh, I've got Facebook. And, I, and it was all about the way that she uh, had learnt to say that she was busy because she thought that that meant that she was doing well. So being busy is high status. So for all those reasons, and no doubt many more, we work, still work long hours, those of us who are lucky enough to have jobs. So why do we need to change? Well, we face what I can only describe as a triple crisis. We have accelerating uh, climate change and damage to the natural environment. We have widening social inequalities. And we have, well, a, a, a state of affairs where national economies are unstable. And there are a few predictions that we're going to return to the kind of economy we had before the 2007-8 crash. So we have economic instability. We have uh, 
uh, widening inequalities and we have really potentially catastrophic threats to the natural environment. This is a toxic combination of crises and it is unique in human history. We've never had a set of crises coming together like this before. I know history always repeats itself, but this has not happened before. So we need to do something about it. Now, we think that time, thinking differently, using time differently, can help us get out of the mess. And I want you to understand I do not see this as some kind of silver bullet. So what I'm proposing is not an answer to the problem, but we think that it can help us to get out of the mess that we're in. So there are examples of people doing things differently. There are plenty of things that we can look at that would make us think, yes, it is possible to use work paid hours differently. We've been started to amass a, a database of examples of short hours working, if you like, Cut from, some from country policies and others from businesses and so on. And, and I just put um, a very nice young worker on it over the summer. I said, just bring everything together in one place. And he, found, he was only working there for two weeks, and he found 100-plus examples, just like that. We haven't been able to look into them yet, but we know that there's a lot of examples out there of short hours working. The two pictures here represent the, 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 the three-day week in the UK in the 1970s when there was a miners' strike, and we, uh, everybody had to go down to a three-day week. And the surprising thing about that was that uh, everybody thought the economy would crumble, but actually Actually, the productivity rates held up interestingly well. And the other is the uh, experiment with the 35-hour week in France. Many people call it a disaster, said it didn't work. Actually, it was very popular. That's a long story I haven't got time to go into. In addition, you have the state of Utah in the United States had a very interesting experiment where they put all public sector workers on a four-day week. They didn't reduce their hours, but they gave them a three-day weekend. Um, and it was very popular with the workers it reduced the costs of the state, and it reduced the carbon footprint of the state. The reason, and it was all been evaluated by a team from Stanford University, the reason it came to an end was about political infighting, not because it was a failure. Um, so that's one example where you probably know that Gothenburg uh, has started an experiment with a 30-hour week. They're going to put one group of, this is the city of Gothenburg, going to put, you probably pronounce it differently, sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. You put, uh, they're putting one group of workers on a 30-hour week and comparing them over a year with other groups of workers in the same uh, city workforce to see, because they're, they want to test the hypothesis, that you really don't get much more productive after you've done 30 hours. So they don't think that this group of workers is going to be less productive than the others. Interesting, we shall see. In Gambia, in 2013, they announced they were going to go down to a four-day week uh, to give people time off for prayer and farming. And um, Google, as many of you may know, give their workers 20% of their time for, uh, to, to work on their own to, because they think that this will help to spark innovation. These are just some examples of how things can be different. Now, I just want to go through some of the reasons I think that uh, we, we do need to move towards a shorter working week. There would be more people in paid work. I'm going to come back to this. It's obviously not a simple equation. Um, long, work, long working hours are very stressful. You get a stressed and anxious workforce and a stressed and anxious population, which isn't good for your well-being or your relationships. Um, people would have more control over their time because they would have more time that they control directly rather than being at work. And there has been some very interesting research that shows that how much control you feel you have over your life, whether it's your working life or the whole of your life, is a, an important determinant of your mental and physical health. So control is important. Um, so, generally, there would be better well-being for both people who are out of work, because there'd be more people who would be able to get jobs, and for people who are in work, and fairer shares between women and men. Now, I couldn't really believe some of the things I heard about the gender gap this morning. Um, one of the main reasons why there is a, a, a gap between, uh, which has proved very intractable, in spite of decades of very strong campaigning by women, why do we still have such a gender pay gap? Well, it is, has a lot to do with the distribution of paid and unpaid time between women and men. And we're increasingly hearing from men how they feel that they are 
cut off from their families, and they want to spend more time at home. But the cultural norms continue to reinforce this idea that men have to go out to work long hours, and that usually means that women、uh, take time off when they have children and get trapped in this cycle of low-paid, low-status part-time work and can't then get back. Into the labour market, but you could make that much, much more equal between women and men, because this proposition is not just about more part-time jobs for women. I can assure you, it's about men and women on an equal basis. It would help to unlock that very entrenched feature of time distribution that、uh, is a, a fundamental cause of continuing gender inequalities.、Um, it would free up. Time for us all to be better parents and carers,、uh, better friends, better neighbours, to、uh, take part in community-based activities, and to take part in politics. This is a, a, a hypothesis I have. I haven't been able to prove it. I haven't tried it. I haven't had the chance to. But I think that one of the reasons why we find our democracies to be in a moribund state is that we don't have time for politics, to find out what's going on, to get involved in meetings, to do the canvassing, whatever you might need to do. To make trouble, and how convenient for the elites that we are all supposed to be working hard, so that we haven't got time to make trouble and change the world. So we need it for politics too, and making more of later life. You would, you could have,、uh, and I'll come back to this in a minute, a much gentler transition from paid work to、uh, no paid work at the end of a working lifetime. There's no reason why it should be. You know, you work 40 hours, say, then sudden drop to doing nothing, which of course is how we describe not working for money is doing nothing. It's often doing many things, but nevertheless, that sudden drop is very bad for your health, kills a lot of people, and it's、uh, an unnecessary way of, of managing the、um, uh, working life of older people. So those are the social reasons. Now we come on to the environmental reasons. Well. This is really where we began with this idea of working time, because we we wanted to problematise the idea that it's important to work harder and work longer to earn more money to keep on buying all the stuff that we think we need in order to retain or improve our so-called living standards, and we want to question how much is really enough. What do we really need to earn? Now, I'm not talking about people on low pay, and I'm going to come on to low pay in a minute. I'm talking about people on average earnings and above, who will often say we couldn't possibly、um, cut our working hours because it would mean we wouldn't be able to earn as much as we do. And I want to go on earning. It would perhaps be about a second car,、um, another skiing holiday,、uh, all the things that we have in our homes that、uh, we appear to need but possibly don't. So. One thing about reducing the working week is that it would begin to perhaps raise a debate about how much is enough, what do we really value in life, and what, how much do we really need to buy.、Um, a lot of our high energy consumption is about being busy. So we take the plane instead of the train, we take the car instead of the bike, or Travelling by foot or by public transport because we're too rushed. We haven't got the time. We buy high-processed,、uh, ready meals instead of perhaps cooking things for ourselves.、Uh, we chuck things out and buy new ones instead of getting them repaired. We buy things instead of making them for ourselves, and so on and so on. So, in order to lead more sustainable lifestyles, we need more time. It would help us to change our patterns of living in order to protect the. Environment, so more time to live sustainably. Then we come on to, oh yeah, no, this one.、Um, I discovered recently that the fastest-growing sector, business sector in the UK, is this personal self-storage. So what we're doing, in fact, is we're filling up our houses with stuff. Then our attics and our outhouses, and because we have filled every possible nook and cranny, we have to go out and hire. A rent, a personal self-storage unit, and I don't know if it's the same here. It may not be, but if you look anywhere around, usually in the sort of suburbs of, of London, certainly whenever you, I drive out of London, they're huge and everywhere. These personal self-storage units,、um, and so we're buying more things than we need. Okay, onto the economic reasons. Well, if we did have a shorter working week, there would be 
at least partly an opportunity to create more jobs for people who don't have any jobs at all. Now, as I said earlier, I don't think this is a simple equation. You don't get, you know, cut the hours by so much and get the same number of hours in new jobs. But it would create opportunities for more people who don't have jobs to have jobs. So there would be a knock-on positive effect for the unemployment figures and for the numbers of people who are claiming benefits because they haven't got jobs at all. So there would be a fairer distribution of paid working time than there is at present. Um, it would help to manage a low-growth economy and to end credit fueled consumption. Now, uh, there are environmental ec economists like Tim Jackson and Peter Victor who've been looking at this, and they've been trying to model a sustainable economy. And they, they realize that if, you, if, if growth uh, doesn't keep on increasing, economic growth, you're going to have, or if it, if it declines, you're going to have um, higher unemployment. And that will cause distress and conflict and resentment and political opposition and so on. And so they came to the conclusion that one way you could deal with that problem would be to move to shorter hours of paid work. And so that is one way in which you can help to manage a, 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 a genuinely sustainable economy. Because an economy that continues to grow is not sustainable. It is incompatible with meeting our uh, carbon reduction targets. Just for starters, um, there's very good uh, evidence that people who work shorter hours are more productive hour for hour, and also that a, sh a workforce that has a, a better balance, has, that are not stressed and anxious and overworked, but have a better balance between work life and home life, are more loyal, more committed, more stable, you get that more rounded, they're bringing an, a greater range of experience into the workplace. So that makes for a, a better workforce a more, and a, a better bottom line, if you like, a more stable and productive workforce. So those are just some economic reasons why um, a shorter, moving to a shorter working week would be economically helpful. Um, and I want to show you this. Now, if you look at this, you'll see how back in 1980... Can I point this? Uh, there. You see, you've got Germany and the United States almost exactly in the same place in terms of average hours per capita. Now look what happened to them. You've got the US up there and Germany down there. And as far as I know, there's no compelling sign that Germany is doing a lot worse than the US in terms of its economic success. And if you look at this one here, I'm sorry Finland isn't in there, but you've got 10 countries, OECD countries, and they're ranked in terms of the average hours per capita worked. Netherlands at the top, Italy at the bottom. Now, if working longer hours was good for a country's economy, you'd expect the next graph to follow that red line. But look, it's almost in the opposite direction. So one thing you can take from this is that there's no correlation between the average hours worked per capita in any country and the strength of a country's economy. Now, I would never suggest that this is going to be easy. We have plenty of uh, challenges. Um, there are one challenge that uh, is the most obvious one, the one that is of most often put to us, is that uh, the impact on poverty. If you cut hours, you cut pay, then the poor are going to suffer most. And I'm going to come back to that. I think that's a very important thing to take into account. Perhaps it'll just mean more people doing overtime or getting second jobs. That's another problem. It goes against the grain of uh, competitive business culture. I've often been told that it would be terribly bad for Britain's competitiveness when I talk about this uh, on panels and in, so on in, in the UK. And, and one thing I have to say to that is, well, what are we competing for? I mean, what is the point of competition? Do we want to drive other countries into the ground so that we can be successful? So, I would assert, just for starters, the idea that we might seek a more collaborative approach. But I've also given you reasons why it wouldn't necessarily be bad for the way that the economy operates. But it certainly does go against the grain of business culture. 
Now, that is something we have to deal with. And there are very poor incentives for employers in most countries, as far as I understand, to uh, take on a, a bigger work workforce with, with fewer hours per worker. And people say it's more difficult to manage a part-time um, workforce. Well, I've managed part-time workforces. I think it's what you can get used to. I think you can learn how to do it, but that is, that is a problem. And um, a certain amount of resistance from the trade unions, because, of course, their job is to defend the wage, and I've noted that trade unions are not yet ready to take this on, although many of them are very supportive because they worry about the impact on the wage, and I think that's a, a good reason to worry. But, uh, so there, and, and resistance from employees at all levels, not just through trade unions, because they worry about the impact on their standard of living, so-called, um, which would just bring me back to the point about what are you earning money for? You know, you work to live, you live to... You, you, you live to work, you work to earn, you earn to buy, you're buying stuff that's wrecking the planet. Is this really what our lives are supposed to be about? Um, and there's a question about, you know, we don't want people pushing us around. I hear this quite often. We don't want government passing a law. We're actually not going to suggest that there's a, a law passed and we have the kind of time police going around the cafes and the call centres saying, you know, how much time are you putting in? N not at all. But there is an issue there about um, how you introduce these changes so that people don't feel so that people can still feel that they control their lives. I think that's important. So those are some of the challenges of transition. So how are we going to make the transition? Here are some suggestions. They don't necessarily answer all of those challenges, but uh, it, it has been suggested, I think wisely, that where there are large workforces that have fairly large workforces that have a, an annual pay negotiation with employers, that they could trade in a small bit of time each year for a small bit of the pay increase that they would have, thereby losing no money and gaining some time. And it's worth remembering that money that you earn can um, be undermined by inflation, but you can't undermine time. And the time that you, the extra time that you get is still the extra time. It can't be undermined by any rate of inflation. Um, we've suggested that, uh, uh, that you bring all new labour market entrants in on 30 hours a week. Again, people don't lose anything because they haven't been in work before, but they start their first job on 30 hours and stay that way. And then each year you bring in a new cohort and um, eventually you get a critical mass. Um, uh, that would help the issue of there being not nearly enough jobs for young job seekers these days. Not an answer to the problem, but it might help. We've also suggested that older workers reduce their working week by one hour a year. Now, if you started at, let's say, the age of 55, just for the sake of the argument, you're on, let's say, um, a 40-hour week at 55, then by 65, you're on a 30-hour week. By 75, you're on a 25-hour week. And this is what I meant when I referred to this gradual taper for older workers. So you get a much, much uh, easier transition to retirement. And that would be an interesting way of, of making that change. So you, have, you get it from both ends of the age scale, if you like, until gradually everybody's doing the same thing. Um, employers' costs should be per hour, not per employee. A lot of employers have to pay um, a, a tax to the government for each employer that they have, and perhaps that should be based on hours rather than per capita. And um, you would need active, active training policies to fill the skills gaps that you would have if you started to have um, people moving into a shorter working week. And you want regulation to back up what our proposal is, that we do this gradually over a decade or more, and at critical points, you move to, you, you introduce uh, regulation to underpin it. And that regulation should enable people to, um, to feel they have got control. So you want flexibility, different arrangements, job sharing, term times, uh, shifts, uh, sabbaticals, and so on, to suit different conditions. So... Um, and also the right to ask your employer for, to work shorter hours and not to be refused unreasonably. And the laws against discrimination on grounds of people working short hours. So there are all the, those sorts of things you can do to underpin this gradual move. Um, and then we must... Any move towards a shorter working week has to go hand in hand with a move to tackle low pay. 
If people say we can't move to shorter working hours because um, people can't afford it, then that's a problem of low pay, not a problem of hours. No one should have to work over long, unsocial hours in order to make ends meet. So we need um, a concerted effort to tackle low pay through a higher minimum wage, improve state benefits, um, secure public services that are of a high quality for everyone, and uh, more uh, value attached to uncommodified activities and more um, living sustainably, as I said. Is it possible? Can anything change like that? Well, we can change the unchangeable. Here are some examples of things where people thought that it was inconceivable that you could make a change. And within a relatively short period of time, things changed radically. And at that point, it became inconceivable to change back again. You can probably think of other examples. My examples are the slave trade, um, making motorcyclists wear, wear helmets. When that was introduced, I think it was in the late 1970s, there was a terrible uproar about it. This is a frightful incursion in our personal freedom. We can't possibly do it. Now, nobody would suggest that you get rid of the law that makes motorcyclists wear helmets. And the smoking ban. Um, again, much more recently, there was a dreadful uproar about that. And everybody's saying how it was a terrible nanny state. We couldn't do it. It was very bad for everybody and so on. And of course, now we've got it and we wouldn't dream of going back to uh, having smoking in bars and restaurants. As far as I'm aware, you may disagree, but I don't think we'll go back on that one. And last but not least, all the advances that women made. I mean, before women got the vote, it was thought inconceivable by the majority that they couldn't possibly do that. They weren't normal human beings. They, didn't, they shouldn't have the right and so on. Of course, now, if anybody said, let's take votes away from women, it would be inconceivable. Same with equal pay and, and many of the other advances that women have made. So it is possible to change the unchangeable. It is possible to move to shorter hours. It's not easy. It will take a while. But we think that it can solve social, environmental and economic problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, because time is not on our side right now, so Anna, Anna needs to catch her plane, so we're going to change our original plan just a little bit, so uh, we're going to take questions uh, aimed at uh, directly to Anna Kut right now. And we're going to have the uh, comments from Tarja Filatov after that. So, comments or questions? So, <clears throat> it's on? Yeah. Uh, I think your presentation was very interesting. Uh, you tell us... Yeah, so you tell us that people should work less. And then there is a slide that tells us that virtually everybody is against it. Uh, the poor lose. Uh, the unions are against it. Uh, the employers are against it. And then you tell us we are not in favor of any coercive policies. Uh, <clears throat> and then you tell us what to do for the transition. And this is only coercive policies, which is not surprising given that, you know, in your preceding slide, you explained to us that everybody is against the policy that you propose, or virtually everybody. So, of course, you know, you cannot uh, have a transition without coercive policies. Right, challenges of transition, exactly. So, uh, why, why are the British against it? Well, maybe because they are <coughs> more intelligent than the French. Uh, as a French, you know, I come from your future, and um, it does not work. In particular, those who, uh, well, in particular, you tell us we need more public services, but if the public servants uh, work less, you don't get more public services, you get less public services. And in fact, when the 35 hour week was introduced in France, there were big issues in hospitals. So what do you do to uh, compensate for that? You need more people working in the public service, so you need more taxes. And how could you get more tax receipts if you have less people working? Uh, uh, well, uh, you end up in a sort of spiral of, you know, uh, economic uh, regress. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, that, that's a big issue in France. Also, you may ask, you know, when you go to France, why do you queue 
20 minutes uh, to pay for your groceries, whereas if you go to Asian countries, it's instantaneous. Yeah, I, I am. Well, that's because of the 35 hour week, you see. <laughs> this, uh, we've done quite an interesting um, analysis of that in this volume, actually. So it's, it's uh, all in the presentation. But let's have some more questions. I'll come back to your points. Is that going to be, shall I put this on? Well, uh, in the year 1970, there was plenty of leftist pamphlets in Finland, but there was also a bourgeois liberal pamphlet, The uh, Society of Choice, by uh, professors of, of the Helsinki School of Economics. And there they proposed a 30-hour 30 30 working week. That means six hours a day in two phases. How do you say it? Kaksi työvuoroa. And uh, they calculated that the increase in the use of capital is enough to pay this reformation. And my father, who was a professor of economics, thought that it would be possible in the 80s or in the 90s. But now we are still asking whether this, a this is an economic possibility or whether it is an economic necessity. Any more questions? Should I deal with those two? Oh, we've got another one. Sorry. Very shortly, um, you speak about uh, shortening working hours in the UK. Uh, what about uh, the Finnish workers who asked the Building Workers Union? Is there any time schedule? for how much we have to work. No, not in England was the answer. Good, then we we have our, take it back to Finland, it's only on Sunday, then we can work more than six or seven hours a day during five days or six days, and then we can keep the Sunday free and go on a football match. Uh, so my question is, how uh, should you evaluate the possibilities to get the England, England on board the EU treaty uh, on uh, working time and so on? OK. Shall I do those three? Well, I'll go backwards. Yes, you're quite right. Um, the UK is terrible on the working time directive. It's a, an outrage. Um, we hope to vote this government out soon, whether we will or not, or whether the new government will do anything about it. I'm not sure, but um, it is an important thing that these working time, the working time directive has been useful in um, helping us to move in this direction and being exempt from it or having a, a loopholes that we can escape through is, uh, is not helpful. So I agree with you. On your point here about was it an economic necessity now, I mean, I would, I would go back to this slide, actually. The one about the, this one. This is why we need to do it. Because, we, because it's not just an economic necessity. I mean, whether it's an economic necessity or not depends on what you think an economic necessity is. And I'd say there were probably many different views in this room about what an economic necessity is. And um, I, would, I would say it was an environmental necessity and a social necessity. And I think um, we have to remind ourselves that the economy isn't a kind of act of God or an act of nature, it's a social construction, just like the way we understand time. And we can make a different economy if we have the political will to do that. Um, so that's... So I would say it's, that's why we need to do it now. And it, 
it'll take time. I don't think it's going to be, it's going to happen tomorrow. What we're trying to do at the New Economics Foundation is to create a different climate of opinion that is more, that is widespread and more accommodating to these kinds of ideas. Now, coming back to the questions that were put to me at the beginning, um, I didn't say everyone was against it. I said we have to be realistic and, and acknowledge that it's, not, that it's not going to be an easy ride. There are, there are difficulties. There are people who disagree with us. Of course there are. It would be very odd if there weren't. Um, I didn't say we would have no coercive policies. I did say I thought it would be a bad idea to have a, a single law like the French had that said we all go to a 30-hour um, week, for example because I think we have learned some things from the French experiment, and one is that people lo you lose support for the law if you lose control. Uh, the more you p workers feel that they are losing control over their time, the less likely they're going to be to support those kinds of, of changes. So, but I do approve of some uh, underpinning regulations, which I think we would need, including the Working Time Directive, just for starters in the UK, and including the kinds of regulatory uh, changes that I suggested. So, um, I think that answers your questions. All right. uh. Thank you so much, Anna. I think it's, we have to move on now.